And our next guest asks the pressing, well, maybe not pressing, but interesting question. Uh, what would Star Trek be without the socialism? And uh, longtime viewers of the program may recollect that a while back we had Manu Sadia on. He is the author of the book Treconomics, which argues that the utopian future portrayed in the Star Trek series, uh, especially the first one, uh, was essentially a uh, vision of socialism. But we'll get into that and also the new Star Trek series with our next guest, Lyta Ford. Now, Lyta is the amusement amusements, I'm sorry, Lyta Gold. Lyta is the amusements editor of uh, Current Affairs magazine, and uh, we've had Nathan J. Robinson, the editor-in-chief of that magazine, on several times, but I enjoy Lyta's writing as well, very much, and so she joins us now. So first of all, Lyta, I am sorry for mangling your last <laughs> name. No problem. And secondly, thanks for coming on the program. Thanks. I'm so happy to be here. And I think I, I, I said Ford because I was watching the latest Westworld episode last night. Ah, uh, there we go. And, and I, no spoilers. But um, <clears throat> so, okay, let's start with this. Um, you, you, uh, before you get into the new series, the Discovery series, mm -hmm. you point out some, um, what I call those inconvenient truths, I would say, about the original Star Trek series. Now, bearing in mind, I was a science fiction nerd kid when that came out, uh, and I'm talking about the William Chatner, and I even, at, at age 11 or whatever, 10, I think, uh, perceived what you perceived in the original Star Trek, which you describe as dorks in space. <laughs> you, <laughs> you say, William Chatner is a terrible actor, the special effects have often been absurd, and the imagined future is an earnest and treacly one. I think, except for the last one, I perceived all of those things. I mean, look, I, the original Lost in Space had better set design and special effects than the original Star Trek. Um, and it was pretty bad. So why did people like it? Well, that's the interesting thing. There, there were a lot of sci-fi shows on, uh, on at that time. Um, but Star Trek has stuck around. And I think, and it's had a lot of different iterations, TV shows, movies, and I think the big reason it stuck around is because it's because of its dorkiness, because it's people getting along, because it's a utopian future, and it's a, it's not a perfect utopia, uh, but the civilization that humans live in is far better than the one they live in now, and it's about working out working out the problems that we have, and it sort of abstracts them out so that they take place in, in this larger. You, uh, this larger universe with different species and, and things like that. But one of the bases of this utopia, of this, the Federation in this utopia, is that it's socialist. It is a post-scarcity socialist government. And what, you know, the phrase that gets thrown around sometimes now, and just as a phrase, it's like the catchiest ever, is fully automated luxury communism, <laughs> right? I love that phrase. Isn't it awesome? And it's basically <laughs> saying that we all have, uh, like the, the replicators in Star Trek, you know, uh, I want uh, a dry martini and uh, a steak medium rare and a 1957 Chevy convertible. And it will just produce it for you. Uh, so that is the future that's kind of portrayed in the original Star Trek, maybe the, the, the following series as well. So humanity has solved its problems, and, and I didn't realize at the time as a child, but uh, in retrospect, uh, you know, it's clear it was also, you know, it was an interracial society, it was, there was, you know, uh, racial equality. Humanity had basically solved its problems, and I guess I would say, Lida, that, um, that that was a reflection of the optimism of our mm -hmm. culture in the 1960s that we were still experiencing the post-World War II boom in economic growth, that, that e economic growth was being shared equally at that point between uh, employers or investors, you know, the, the capitalist class and workers. If you look, their wages and, 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 and wealth were, were growing in tandem. So it basically seemed as if you know, the predictions in the 60s, looking back on them, that uh, another model I always go to is the Jetsons, right? George Jetson 
uh, worked two hours a week at his job and had made enough money to support a, an entire family, a robot made and a flying space car. So, you know, that was what people were, obviously there was racism and other problems, but people basically felt we were on track to have a future of prosperity and uh, it was, as you mentioned, a socialist future and uh, eventually everybody would be included, right? Mm -hmm. So now we get to, uh, uh, so first of all, uh, we were talking before we went on the air, uh, before we get to Discovery, then we had Star Trek Next Generation, which I think is probably my favorite of all the series. Uh, we had uh, uh, Star Trek Voyager, we had um, Enterprise, and we had what I think is your favorite, Deep Space Nine. Why was that your favorite? So it's interesting that you talk about the, um, the post-war mentality that led to the first show, because I think each iteration of Star Trek has really shown different ideas that were around in the culture at the time. It, um, in Next Generation, the, the villain is the Borg, and they're a collectivist group. It's, you know, they're the evil robots, and all the robots are interfaced with each other, and, and it's, it, they, they live in a collective, and they have no individuality of their own. And there's a couple different ways to read that, but it also can read as a reaction to Soviet communism in the mm -hmm. 80s, which is um, the next gen. And then, so Deep Space Nine was the next one after that, and it was um, early 90s, sort of ran for the whole 90s. And so that was what was on TV when I was a teenager, so that's what I watched. Um, and what I, what I love about that one is it's still a utopia. It's still the same federation that everybody knows and loves. But some darker elements of more disturbing elements are seeping in. There's um, a, a more of a sense of uh, spies and how spies work hmm. and that there might be this... Um, uh, you know, espionage that's going on behind the scenes, the Federation does some things that aren't great and isn't exactly as honest and as moral, but is trying to be, and the heroes are all people who are trying to be honest and moral people who find out that terrible things are happening and work to stop them. So it, it never loses utopian character. So that's interesting because what, you, what you're saying, so first of all, I, I, I think you're probably right about the Borg. You know, they were a collective. Mm -hmm. People were given numbers or, or impersonal right, names right. when they were absorbed. Individual cultures were uh, obliterated, you know, so the mm -hmm. music or art of a planet would be lost and they would all become identical. Resistance is futile and all that. Mm -hmm. um, but so Deep Space Nine was basically saying not all was well in the Empire. Yeah. Is that what right. you're saying? Right. And, and it's, it's very interesting for the 90s, and, and which, as I recall, was a, a time where that was sort of starting to seep into the, the consciousness. And it's hard because I was growing up then, too, so I don't know what was, what was me learning it and what was everybody else learning it, too. Well, one of the interesting uh, things about the 90s, just to, and, and by the way, I just flashed on why I called you Lyda Ford. She was the lead guitar <laughs> player for The Runaways with uh, oh, Joan Jett. Oh, right, of course. Um, You'd think I would have known that. <laughs> uh, but one of the things about that characterized the 90s, Ronald Reagan had just finished his presidency and had said the government is evil. And then Bill mm -hmm. Clinton had come in and tried to parse the difference by saying government should be no bigger than it needs to be. We should make government right. small enough. So, so there was a sense that government might be intrusive and not a force for good. Maybe that characterized some of the mm -hmm. Federation intrigue in Deep Space mm -hmm. Nine. Um, and then we had um, the... There's uh, Voyager, which I watched a little of. Yeah. I don't really remember it very well, to be honest. Yeah. They're lost. It was nice. Um, yeah. yeah. And mm -hmm. then we had uh, the Enterprise, which I never watched. Yeah. I don't know about uh, you. I've seen one or two episodes. It's, it's really, it's just not a well-made show. It's hard to get into. Yeah. So and I that, can't really characterize it. So that gets um, in, in, uh, us to um, uh, Discovery, which is, yes. isn't that what it's called? Discovery, yeah. Discovery, yeah. So it sounds like it's a drag. Oh, it's such a drag. And it's such a shame. I really wanted to like this show. But um, so they, they said it 10 years before the original series. Mm -hmm. And um, so it's 10 years before Kirk and Spock and all those guys. Um, and it's, it, they forgot to make it socialist, which was a choice. I mean, they didn't forget. They just didn't think it was an important part of it. So it's, it's much like uh, any other Star Trek, or it's much like any other um, space show right now, any other sci-fi show. It's, uh, it's dystopian. And, you know, it's interesting. Uh, in fiction, a lot of people are writing dystopias. And there's some reason for that. It's because we feel we live in a dystopia, and that's fair in many ways. But on the other hand, it's, it's so strange to take an existing utopia 
and then really just rearrange it to make it this very disturbing, highly militaristic, which even though technically Starfleet is a military, it's never really been militaristic in this sense. Um, and they, they really, you know, and I, I never want to be one of those people who's like, oh, no, my my precious pop culture, don't mess with it. But this is, <laughs> it's kind of a different thing when you sort of lose the entire spirit of what the story is about and when there are so few socialist stories. And the, certainly that made it onto TV. And there's so few utopias that made it on TV. And this would be a nice time to see a utopia and to see what, how we could live. But yeah. instead they thought it would be more fun to have explosions. So there's explosions. Well, you know, what's interesting about that is that even though there were explosions on the other Star Trek series, going back mm -hmm. to the original one, there were always, you know, conflicts with, uh, you know, Klingon or Romulan vessels mm -hmm. or whatever. Uh, there was always the sense that the Federation was, you know, it had, I forget what it was called, the Prime Directive or whatever, you weren't yes, supposed to, yes. you weren't supposed to interfere with the culture. I mean, there was this great respect mm -hmm. for indigenous cultures of different planets, and there was this right. culture of non-interference, and they were always emphasizing diplomacy and negotiation, and Spock's father was a diplomat, and and, and, and the, the career path, I, I'm just remembering this now, but the career path would be you'd be a ship's captain, then you'd be an admiral, and then if you were really good, you'd become a diplomat. And, um, you, you know, you, there would always be these retired admirals who were working in service of negotiating peace and that kind of thing. And now it seems like what you're telling me is that this <clears throat> discovery now is saying now we're good, we blow... I can't use the S word on, on you know, because for FCC reasons. But we blow, we blow stuff up. It seems to be <laughs> basically the the ethos of the Federation in Discovery. Is that true? More or less. Um, and you know, it's one of the stranger choices that they made. So anytime that the Federation would have a conflict with one of the other species, it, even though the you know the other species might be doing bad things, they were always portrayed as having a distinct culture that was a value, you know, it was just different. They had different values. They had different things that they cared about, but they were a civilization. And so they, they chose this time to make the enemy of the Klingons and we're supposed to have this very honorable culture, very bloody, but very honorable. And they totally rewrote it to say that they're religious fanatics and they're cannibals and they're kind of every nasty, evil stereotype that we have in our culture of, of, of non-Western invaders. And right. it's it's really grotesque. Well, that they it, chose to make this it, al it also sounds like, and correct me if I'm wrong, but it sounds like it could have a racial dimension, because it appears to. You know, because first of all, yeah. it always struck me that <coughs> Klingons or alien should... enemy aliens were a different color than than us white mm -hmm. people. Okay, and number mm -hmm. one. And number two, if you throw in that they had their religious fanatics and their cannibals, those yeah. seem to me to be touching on tropes that, you know, I would not boldly go, you know, <laughs> where no other Star Trek series has gone, if that's where you're going. Mm -hmm. What do you think? Yeah, um, yeah, there's always been some messiness in Star Trek about that. They've tended to cast darker skinned actors to play more violent people. It's pretty, pretty ugly. Um, uh, and lighter skinned character, lighter skinned actors to play more peaceful people. It's, just, it's kind of a gross thing that they, they've done. But it's never been quite this overt. And it's not, you know, one would think that we'd sort of move past doing that sort of thing and, and could really think about it. Uh, yeah, it's um, the Klingon Messiah, that's really a thing in the show, is um, absolute black skin. That's, oh, really? I think he's one of the first things you see. I think he is the first thing you see in the first episode. And it's, it's a, I mean, it's a really direct choice. And that's, sometimes in storytelling, I think we tend to, pre we, we pretend that these things just sort of happen. You know, these, that's just the decision that the makeup artist made or whatever. And it's not, it, these are choices. And choosing to portray the Klingons a certain way, choosing to make their, them look a certain way, especially when they didn't look that way in any of the other shows, it, mm. it's, and choosing to make the Federation not socialist. These are all decisions that really tell us something about what what the showrunners think people want, right? what they think they want to see, and what they think that the correct ethos is. Yeah, and what they think the zeitgeist is summoning up right, right now, which is disturbing. And, you know, apparently they do torture and stuff. And to oh, me, yeah. I don't think if you want a, a, you know, a mixed future of 
good and bad with a lot of dystopia thrown in on television. I don't think you're ever going to top uh, the Battle Star Galactica reboot. Oh, those are wonderful. Weren't they great? I, that I thought was, that, was, that was a great show. Yeah. Amazing. And they had an episode on the moral question of torture that I thought was unbelievable. I thought mm -hmm. was it, just gripping. Uh, but it sounds like these guys are just sort of portraying an ugly universe. Yeah. Yeah, and it, it, it's funny that you could you could swap out nouns. You could call the Federation something else and the Klingon something else, and you'd have a totally different show. It would not be recognizable as a Star Trek show. It, it doesn't have any of the features. It doesn't have any of the charm or the dorkiness or, or people having fun or having a good time together. It's really very sad and stressful to watch. Well, I don't want to end on a dra bummer note. So <laughs> I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to like put a pin in this and say, you know, bad series. I don't want to watch it. Um, well, let's end with this. What's your favorite uh, Battlestar Galactica moment or episode? Oh, God, I haven't seen it in a while. Um, you know, it's hard to pin down a moment, but I absolutely love Starbuck. Uh -huh. uh, she's wonderful. You know, it's, so I'm sure you know that in the original series, Starbuck is, is a man. Right, I did know. And they, yeah. they rewrote, and, and it's, it's wonderful. It was, it's amazing what a difference it makes, because as a man, Starbuck is just like your average kind of Han Solo ripoff, not that interesting. But once you make a swashbuckling pilot, cool guy into a woman, he, she becomes the most interesting person because you haven't seen that kind of character before. And it's really, a, she's, she's a joy. She is, a, and, she, and she drinks, and she fights, and she does all oh, that yeah. stuff, but she's, uh, all right, well, we'll leave it there. <laughs> um, but uh, great, I, I loved all the issues you, you touched on in the whole Thanks. Star Trek pantheon, and I'm a big fan of your writing it. Current Thank Affairs, you. so Light of Gold, Amusements Editor for Current Affairs. Thanks for coming on the program. Thanks. It was wonderful to do this.